Alright, what's up everybody? We're back with another edition of Everyday Hoops. Hope you guys are having a good one. So today's video, we're going to be grading the NBA Draft. I did a live stream of grading the NBA Draft today where I went through every pick, dived in, talked about how I felt for every team, and I did it live here on the channel. If you missed it here, this video is basically a VOD of that draft grade. It's a very long video. But I went very in depth, and you can probably just get skip around and find your favorite team if you really wanted to go in. But that's what we're doing today. Thank you guys for the views on the videos and the shorts recently. I really appreciate it. If you do like the content around here, consider subscribing, like, turn notifications, do all stuff like that. I'd really appreciate it. It really upset a lot. Uh, join the membership if you want to learn more about the membership. There's a video on my channel explaining all of it. You can go back and watch that. And probably going to be on a little more live stream. We might be live streaming the first day of free agency on June 30th or july 1st whatever one of those days so we might be doing another live stream there so if you want stay tuned to my community post because that's when i talk about that stuff and do stuff like that but uh yeah basically this is a recap or a recap basically of my live stream that i did of every draft grade and um yeah don't want to say any more of your time let's get right into it hello 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 uh we are back another live edition of everyday hoops And this stream, well, let's do this right now because I'm going to forget later. Now we are officially live. That is way brighter than it, I thought it was going to be, but whatever. Um, anyway, so yeah, hello. What's up, everybody? We are back. We have another live edition of Everyday Hoops. I haven't live streamed in a very long time when I said that we were going to do it sometimes. Um, I might have lied. Uh, but... We are live streaming now. The NBA draft was yesterday and today. The first round was yesterday. Today was the second round. It just wrapped up about half an hour ago, I want to say. And so I'm going to be grading the first round of the NBA draft. Fortunately, I wasn't going to be able to get a video out this morning because I had stuff to do. So I decided, you know what? Let's do it live. Let's make it a live draft grading stream. So that's what we're going to do here today. Talk about the draft. And this is also going to turn into a video that you can watch later. So if you're watching the video and not the live um, I'm probably going to be live streaming a little bit more throughout the offseason, just doing random stuff. I'm probably going to be streaming free agency too, the first day of free agency, maybe. I don't want to don't I don't want to put guarantees out there that I can't cash, but that might happen here. And so, um, yeah, uh, I think we shouldn't waste a lot of time because it's going to be a lot to talk about, a lot to get into. So I think we should just do it. Now, so if I'm looking down at my phone for any reason, I'm checking on the chat and I also am looking at like my grades. I graded on my phone as well so um yeah let's get it started in here shall we got a lot to talk about with this nba draft stuff going on all right let's get it going right here i think this should be fine i think yeah you can see this good all right we'll start number one the atlanta hawks took zachary risache um from france with the number one overall pick uh, this was something not super surprising, really. Um, the last couple of days, Alex Saar was my personal number one prospect in this class and stuff like that. But apparently, Alex Saar didn't want to go to Atlanta. Apparently, he was a he didn't want to go to Atlanta. He wanted to go to the Wizards, which is probably the first time in NBA history anybody has ever said, "I want to go to the Wizards." No disrespect, but it's, it's the Washington Wizards, man. It's the first time someone's ever said, well, I want to go to the Wizards. So that changed a lot of things. Donovan Klingon from UConn was a guy that the Hawks really liked, and there's potential talk about him going number one. Even the Hawks came out a couple of days before the draft and said, like, hey, like, we don't care if Alex Hart doesn't want to come here. We might take him number one, kind of trying to force teams to come up and try to get, you know, him at one, but teams weren't biting. They were lying, basically. And so they ended up taking Versace, number one, which was he was my number two guy on my draft board. I don't think this is a bad pick. I feel like I'm seeing a lot more less you know hype or a lot less kind of love for this pick than what i thought it was going to be but i personally don't really mind this pick at all like especially you get a skilled guy at the wing position so my grade for him is going to be an a i'm going with a for Rasache personally i just I, I think this is a solid pick especially if alex already didn't want to come there they do already have clint capella and Yeko Kongwu and Jalen Johnson. So I can kind of see, I guess, he was going to be logjam in that 4-5 spot when there's a lot of things already going on there. And 
with Washington, he's going to get a lot more opportunity. But for Sashe, it's the pick. I think it's a solid pick. I mean, who doesn't need some more shooting, you know, and some good wing play? The Hawks definitely need that. They had a lot of wings. They have DeAndre Hunter still on the team who is good, but he just is injured a whole lot. Uh, Sadiq Bey is a restricted free agent, and he tore his ACL, so I don't know how he's going to come out this year. They j- they traded A.J. Griffin uh, today, earlier. So they just don't really have a lot of wing play. So getting Rasache in there is pretty solid. A guy that can space the floor. Defensively, he has potential, as the Hawks were a horrible defense last year. He has a long wingspan at 6'9". I don't think he has a crazy long wingspan, but he's 6'9". He has the frame to be a good defender. So I think that's solid. So personally, I give it an A. You know, is it the perfect pick, best pick? No. I don't think personally he's the best player in the draft, but I think with the Hawks and kind of seeing what's been going on the last couple of days and them saying kind of like them looking like a team that's kind of looking like they're going to stay packed and they're going to play this game. They're going to keep Trey, keep a lot of the guys, maybe trade DeJounte, hopefully trade DeJounte. I think this is a solid pick, so I'm going to go with A for Rasache to Atlanta personally. I think, I think this is a good pick for them personally in Atlanta. Can't believe all of UConn got drafted. They did, man. All of UConn got drafted. All the championship guys. Donovan Clean, Stephon Castle, Cam Spencer, Tristan Newen. If Alex Hairband didn't go back, maybe he would have been picked up too. Maybe he could have been like the 50 something overall pick, potentially. But all of UConn got drafted. Connecticut won the last couple of days in the draft. I'm going to get more into that. But Connecticut won. If you know, you know. Connecticut won um, the state of Connecticut, not the college. Well, the college did too, but the state of Connecticut won this, won this draft. Um, so that was number one. So let's go to number two. We had Alex Sar go number two overall to the Washington Wizards. Uh, Alex Sar personally was my number one guy on my draft board. I personally think he was the best player in this draft. And I thought he was going to Atlanta, but again, he came out and kind of hinted at, I don't want to go to Atlanta. Landry Fields came out and said there were workouts in place to get him in there, and he didn't show up. So he's kind of saying, Atlanta, I'm good. I want to go to Washington. So I guess he has a lot more opportunity there. Because who's going to take the ball out of his hands in Washington? Jordan Poole? Like, okay. Kyle Kuzma, he might not be in the team in a couple couple weeks. So there's no one really to take the ball out of his hands. So I guess he saw that there's opportunity over there to grow more for, for um, Washington. He saw the potential growth. He has no one in front of him, so he can just kind of do what he needs to do. Over there, um, again, crazy to say that <laughs> I don't want to go to Atlanta. I want to go to Washington, but that's what happened. So ultimately, this pick is an A plus to me. Uh, the Wizards end up getting a guy that I a lot of people thought was the best player in the draft, and the Wizards are a team that desperately needs NBA talent. If there's one team that desperately needed a number one or needs talent, is the Washington Wizards, and they end up getting Alex Sar, a guy that I think could be in that Jaron Jackson, Evan Mobley type mode, maybe even a little bit more depending on his, how his offense works out. Offensively, he's still a little bit raw. There is potential, though, with his shooting ability, the way he can put the ball on the floor and stuff like that. There's potential. But defensively, he's already kind of there. He's 7'1", a long wingspan. I think he has like a 7'4 wingspan, a 7'1". He's athletic, blocks a lot of shots, can move on the perimeter. He's got all defensive first-team type potential. All defensive first-team type potential. It's really just the offense is raw. And how is the offense really going to evolve? But I think at the very least they're going to get a really good defensive, you know, big man that can that's athletic at the very least. And Washington made out with getting probably the number one guy in the draft at number two, and so for Washington you don't complain about that, you know. Uh, so yeah, I think that was a very solid pick by Washington, a very good pick, and someone finally wanted to go to their organization. <laughs> the Wizards are just bad. Can we talk about? No, no, no. We're going to talk about it when we get there, but the Wizards are a bad organization for a couple of reasons. And um, you're going to see why I feel like that once we get there. But let's move on to number three. Reed Shepard goes to the Houston Rockets with the third overall pick. Uh, I honestly was really expecting the Rockets to trade. I would have, if I had to bet money on if the Rockets were going to trade this pick, I would put my money on the Rockets were going to trade this pick. And it looks like they're not going to trade it. They kept this pick, and they ended up taking Reed Shepard, who was a guy that I projected them in the mock draft. I think he was the third best player on my draft board. Uh, Reed Shepard is just a really good basketball player. Really, really good basketball player. For the Houston Rockets right now, that's what they need. They just need really good basketball players. 
over there, and they're building that. I mean, last year they were a couple games away from making the play-in. They were 41-41, and took big strides with Ime Udoka, and now to get a guy like Reed Shepard that could come in, has elite role player traits, Derek White, Ask if you don't know much about this draft, I would compare him to sort of he has Derek White type capabilities. A guy that can do stuff with the ball, he can handle the ball, he can play make a little bit, he can I don't know about the shot creation, but he can make the smart basketball play off the ball, an elite three point shooter. Defensively, he might be small, but he's gonna compete and hold his own, which is what you like to see from guys with that size. Just again, a really, really smart basketball player. So for the Rockets, they get a a for me. They get an A, personally. I love this pick by the Rockets, especially if they were not going to trade it, um, which, honestly, I don't think it's A-plus because I thought they were going to trade the pick. But if you don't trade the pick and you have to get somebody, I guess, why not get just a really talented and smart basketball player? So now you could put him there. He doesn't really, like, mess with anybody else's development. Jalen Green's a two. Amen Thompson played a little bit off the ball as well last year, and he could space the floor for them. Again, he's a guy that doesn't really need the ball in his hands, but when the ball is in his hands, he can make good plays. He could be a kind of young backup to Fred Van Vliet right now. It's just it's an amazing pick by the Rockets. Amazing pick. I they get an A for me. They get an A for me with that pick. We're gonna move on now to number four with the San Antonio Spurs. And they again, Connecticut won. Stefan Castle gets taken off the board at number four to the San Antonio Spurs. Uh, this was something that wasn't really a shocking thing, obviously. Uh, but when the draft lottery came out after, the Spurs are one of the first teams that said, we're interested in Stephon Castle. And I, if he was there at four, which was most likely he was going to be there at four, the Spurs are going to take him. And I think this is an amazing pick for the Spurs. They get an A+. Plus. This is one of the best picks in the draft. The Spurs get a guy that I feel is going to come in and fit very well around Wembunyama, a guy that Castle has a high ceiling, but he has the potential to be the best player in this draft. Stefan Castle has the potential to be the best player in this NBA draft. With the ceiling he has, uh, a lot of people comparing him to a bigger Drew Holiday, I can definitely see that. He's got already an NBA-ready body, and is very athletic, very strong for his, for his height and his age. I, I think he's still only 19 years old. Defensively, he competed great, great defender. You can argue he's one of the best defenders in this draft. Well, no doubt he is the one of the best. You can argue he might be the best defender in this draft. I mean, in the NCAA tournament run, he was holding down, he was locking down number one options on other teams. He was locking down number one options on other teams. And already comes comes in with that fire and aggressiveness defensively that I really, really like. And the offensive end, he can be a Swiss Army knife a little bit. He can be a point guard potentially. He was a point guard until getting to UConn. He was a point guard, so he has that in his game. Uh, he could be an off guard. I loved how he adapted and played at UConn as well, which is one of the most intriguing things, is that usually freshmen try to come in and then try to, you know, get their own, you know, try to find their way. With Stefan Castle, he came right away at UConn, fit a role, they asked him to play a role, and he played it perfectly, which gives a lot of great signs to who he is and how he's going to pan out in the NBA in the future. Because he came in right away at UConn and became a kind of a wing stopper, and off-the-ball cutter type player, UConn, and he played that position perfectly. And now going to the NBA with a system like the Spurs, with Greg Popovich and structure there, I think he's going to do wonders. I think this is a beautiful pick. Honestly, you can argue this is the best pick in the draft. The Spurs got Stefan Castle at four. This is an A-plus pick for me. I mean, how can it not be an A-plus pick? Um, and again, UConn. UConn knows how to do it. Apparently, Connecticut is up right now in terms of the NBA draft. I, I, I love it. I love it, love it, love it, love it. And now this is where we start getting into kind of like the uh, the first four picks, honestly. You can kind of predict that was going to happen. You know, it's not shocking that Stephon Castle went four to San Antonio, that Alex Saar went number two, Reed Shepard went three if the Rockets didn't trade that pick. You know, like the first four picks that kind of were like in stone if no trades happened. This point on, this is where the draft gets kind of like, all right, what's going to happen next? You know? And the next guy, Ron Holland. The Detroit Pistons picked Ron Holland with the number five overall pick, which is not what I was expecting. Um, in my mock draft, I had the Detroit Pistons taking Matas Buzelis, also from the G League Ignite, his teammate, uh, because I just thought that would fit really well. I can't type. 
So I'm trying to do like put the grades in before, you know. But I thought it was going to Montas Bozellis. I thought Ron Hahn was going to fall. I think on my big board, I had him projected around 10 or 11 in big board. Uh, he was a guy that coming out of high school, coming out, he was one of the top players in the class. And then went to the G League. Didn't have a great year. Got injured at the end of the season. And his stock kind of fell. But he has a high ceiling. He has potentially the highest ceiling in the draft. You know, uh, he's very athletic, a wing. Defensively, he competes. He's got a, a aggressive, that dog in him, as you, if you if you will. He's got that. Defensively, he's going to really compete. Uh, really, it's just about the offense, the shooting, really. It's a big question. The shooting ability, he doesn't really have that yet. He likes to attack the rim. He loves to attack. He's very, very athletic. Honestly, you can argue he's probably maybe the best athlete in the draft. So the Pistons take a gamble kind of on upside, which is what I was kind of caught off guard by. And to be honest, at first, I kind of was like, oh, okay. But honestly, the more and more I think about this this pick, the more and more I'm like, you know what? It kind of makes sense for Detroit. I'm going to give him a B plus. Um, I don't think it's a perfect pick. I don't think it's an A plus pick. But I don't think it's a horrible pick. I think it's a B plus type of pick. It's a pick where it's like, you know, you could see it. You can see it happening. It's not a bad pick at all. Ron Hans, I think, can be a really good player in the league. It's just for Detroit, it just it really reminded me of Asar Thompson last year. Ron Holland and Asar Thompson, I think, are going to play a very similar role in the league. Both hyper-athletic guys that can't shoot, that compete and defend. Like, they're kind of the same. They're kind of the same in that way. But what I like about this, though, is that Detroit sucks. <laughs> they don't have a lot of talent. And why not be able to put Asar and Ron Holland together? Because Ron Holland is a little bit more wing. Asar Thompson, I mean, yeah, Asar Thompson, I think is more of a guard. Can project as more of a guard. Ron Holland is more of a wing, a two or three. And the energy and stuff he brings. And Detroit, again, just needs talent. And they really need to put talent around Kate Cunningham and Jalen Duran. And so I don't think this is a horrible pick. I don't think it was the pick I would make if I was Detroit. But I definitely don't think this is a a a bust or anything like that. I think this is a very solid pick from Detroit. They go upside, which if you know the Detroit Pistons draft history, they love to go upside. Uh, Stanley Johnson, uh, Killian Hayes. Um, who else they draft? I can't remember right now, but if you know the Pistons draft history, if you look back at the Pistons draft history, Ron Holland is not a crazy, he's not crazy in that sense. He, he's, he's really not at all. You know, uh, now... We get to this pick. Number six, the Charlotte Hornets select the mystery man, Tejan Saloon or Salon. Salon or Salon from France. Another Frenchman. Three Frenchmen going to the top six. And it won't be the last one we see tonight. And I talk about this draft. Um, he's the mystery man. He's a guy that is very raw. Didn't play. He played a little bit. He was a rotation guy over in France this year. Um, he was someone that kind of rose off draft boards kind of late. I think the last couple of days he rose off from being maybe a mid first to maybe a for sure lottery guy, for sure maybe top 10 guy, and he went in top 10. Um, but he's still kind of a mystery. He's a guy that's definitely not ready to play yet, definitely still raw at 18, probably will be a draft at stash, probably won't be ready for another year or two. We don't really know how much about him. Like, we project his size. He's 6'8", good size already at 18. He's got good length. He projects to be a good shooter and defender but we just don't really know much about him yet is the thing uh so i give this pick a b minus personally um i just uh, for the hornets for me personally i had the hornets taking donovan Klingon at this point i had to john saloon i think he was my 12th projected prospect and apparently it came out after that the spurs were taking him at eight if to john saloon was at eight it was, he was San Antonio's player. And if you wanted to get him, you had to jump in front of the Hornets. and the, I mean, in front of the Spurs, and the Hornets were in front of the sport, the Spurs. There's even talk about the Hornets potentially trading this pick, trying to trade up to three to get Donovan Klingon. Um, but Donovan, you know, still on the board. But they end up going with Tijan, which I was very interested in. Um, they drafted Brandon Miller last year. They, again, kind of go with a gamble. If you know the Charlotte Hornets draft history, similar to the Detroit Pistons, if you know the Hornets draft history, they like to go on. It's not great. Um, MKG, Cody Zeller, Bismack Biombo, James Booknight, Frank Kaminsky, 
Um, not a great draft history. And I don't know. We can't say yet if Dijon falls into that category yet. He has even he literally has only been a Hornet for maybe what twelve hours. So we cannot say that he's going to fall into that category. You know, who knows? He could be one of the greatest players in the league. You never know. He's mystery. But I don't know. I just don't really. With the Charlotte Hornets, are, where they're at right now, you have Lamelo and Brandon Miller, two really good building blocks. And for my, what I would think is you build, you put good players around it. You put good high IQ players. I think a Donovan Clean, a Cody Williams, even at Colorado, like that would have worked. I just don't know. It's like it's the Hornets taking another gamble, and the Hornets are not a franchise right now that needs to take gambles. <laughs> they need for sure talent, and we just we don't know if Tajan Saloon's a, a for sure talent yet. He could be. He could be. That's the thing. I, we don't know. He hasn't even put on a Hornets jersey yet. We, we don't know if he can be. But it's just the mystery and the risk. It's a high-risk, high high-reward high pick. And I don't know if the Hornets are in the position right now to take those kind of picks. I, I just don't think. So that's why they get a B-minus from me personally for this pick. You know, it, it's very surprising. Honestly, one of the most surprising draft picks of the night. You know, like when they picked him, I was like, "Whoa!" Like they they picked him at six. Like that's kind of that's kind of crazy, but they did it. So we'll see what the Hornets do from now. We'll see if he comes over next year, if he's a if he is a draft stash, or what what happens there. Next, the Portland Trailblazers at seven take Donovan Klingon. This was a very interesting one. Um, it came out that Portland, if Donovan Klingon was there. They were going to pick him. And even, I think, I forgot, Woj or someone said, if he came out last year, you're going to draft Portland, was trying to pick him. So Portland's been big fans, have been big clinging fans. And projected, I think he was my number five player, my projected big board. I had him going a pick earlier, six to Charlotte. Um, and this is just a crazy story. Again, UConn, Connecticut in general is up with this pick. Um, if you don't know, Donovan Kling is from Bristol, Connecticut. Um, I played with him in Parks and Rec League in 7th and 8th grade. Um, great player over there. And it's just crazy. Like, it just puts it in perspective, kind of, with this pick. I'm, I want, I'm going to go on a little personal tangent for a second. It's just crazy to think that a dude from Connecticut has made it this far. You know, like a kid from Connecticut. Literally, I played with him as a kid. Like, I don't think you... Like, I played with... Uh, there, I was his teammate for a year or two. We won a championship together. I still have the trophy up here. Like, we won a championship together. And now he's in the NBA. Not even just in the NBA. He's a top 10 pick. Like, that's crazy, man. Connecticut is up right now. But back to the the the, part, the pick in, in itself. Um, my draft grade for Mr. Klingon over to the Blazers is A minus. A minus. I think... It's good for Portland. They get talent. You know, Kling is a very talented player. He's, I think he's a safe pick, honestly, too. He's a safe pick. I mean, nowadays, I say it a lot when I talk about big men and stuff, but nowadays, the mold for big men, if you don't have a Jokic or Embiid or anything great or Sabonis, is if you don't have that, you want a center that's going to set screens, rebound, block shots, and catch lobs. And that was literally everything he did at UConn. Everything the role he played at UConn is gonna be the role he plays in the NBA. Like he's gonna set screens, he's gonna catch lobs, he's gonna rebound and block shots. He's got high defensive potential as a defensive anchor at seven two. He's already NBA ready with his body seven two two eighty two. You don't see many twenty year olds come out in the NBA like that. You know, especially with the mobility kind of he has and the shot blocking, the seven six wingspan he has. You know, um, he's gonna set hard screens. He's gonna rebound the ball. He's gonna be in the paint and. The jump shot may be there. Personally, when I played with him at 12 or 13, he was shooting threes. <laughs> so, again, he, we were 12 or 13, but he was shooting threes. And if you look at his jumper, it's not a bad-looking jump shot. He didn't shoot good from the free throw line, which maybe could be an indicator. But if the jump shot comes out at any point, then, hey, you you got an amazing player. Um, the only thing that doesn't make this a perfect pick for Portland is that they still have DeAndre Ayton and Robert Williams on the roster right now. That could change, especially Robert Williams is a guy that – Looks like might be getting traded. And I honestly, I forget Robert Williams even plays for the Portland Trail Blazers because he only played like five games last year because he's always hurt. But this also means a lot for DeAndre. This kind of saying, DeAndre, you're cool, but you're not a part of the future 
for Portland. And that that's interesting. And I don't really blame him because DeAndre Ayton is – I don't want to go on a tangent, but DeAndre Ayton is – okay, okay, NBA player, okay center. But Donovan, I'm rooting for you, bro. I don't know if you're ever going to see this, but I'm rooting for you, bro. Go over there. Go dominate. Go make a lot of money. And – now he's going to be a Portland Trailblazer. Might have to get a Portland Trailblazer jersey. <laughs> nah, I'm not. Um, now we go to the next pick. This was one of the most shock, probably the most shocking moment of the NBA draft. Right here. Rob Dillingham goes number eight to the Minnesota Timberwolves. He originally was a San Antonio Spur. Then he gets flipped to the Timberwolves for a 2031 unprotected pick and I think a 2030 pick swap. Um, in my mock draft, I have the Spurs taking Rob Dillingham at this pick. But, honestly, it was one of the hardest picks. And looking back at it now, which is kind of like I'm happy that I'm doing this now instead of live reacting. Because now I'm able to think a little bit more and be able to put it, things in perspective. And thinking about it, the Spurs pick at number 8 was the hardest pick of my mock draft to do. Literally, you, I, cu I cut it, and I even mentioned in the video, but I cut it too. But, I didn't know who the Spurs are going to take at 8. They can go so many different directions. Do they go Rob Dillingham? Like, it'll work because they need point guard play and he's a bucket getter, but does he really fit the Spurs? He's, he, he's not a Spurs type player. Do they pick Topic? He's good. Again, point guard, but he's injured and he's not going to probably play for another year. And do the Spurs really want that? Do they go with a wing? Do they do, do they go with Dawn Connect as a veteran? You know? Do they... What do they do? Um, uh, Tijan, apparently Tajan Saloon was going to be the pick. If Tajan Saloon didn't go number six to Charlotte, apparently he was going to go to San Antonio. So now that I think about it, in the moment, I was like, why would the Spurs do this? But think about it now, I'm like, you know what? That makes sense because the Spurs don't really have someone they love right here. And if they're able to get a, a pick for a couple years from now, 2031 unprotected, 2031, seven years from now, who knows what Minnesota looks like seven years from now? Who knows? Anthony Edwards is either the greatest player in Timberwolves history or he's a Laker or something. Like, who knows what happens who knows what's going to happen in seven years from now? So that's good for the Spurs, for the Timberwolves. The Minnesota Timberwolves, a team that was in the conference finals, four wins away from making an NBA finals appearance. To be able to get a guy, Rob Gilliam, who personally for me was a number six in my draft board, a guy that probably was a top ten pick, that is going to fit them. He's going to fit them. Uh, they need some scoring off the bench. They, they definitely saw in the playoffs what got exposed is their lack of, you know, Anyone besides Anthony Edwards to put the ball on the floor and go get a bucket, Rob Dillingham is going to go get a bucket. Rob Dillingham is a guy that is going to go. If he doesn't do anything, he's going to go get a bucket. You know? And so my pick for this, this is A- minus for me. Minnesota is able to sneak into the draft and get a top 10 prospect and a guy that's really going to fit in with the team. He's going to fit. He's fit to need. There's not much pressure on him because he's going to come off the bench and you still have Anthony Edwards and Mike Conley and all this stuff. He's probably going to be like the fifth or sixth option. So he's, he doesn't need to come in right away and do anything crazy. He's a guy for now and for the future when Mike Conley eventually retires. You throw Rob Dillingham in there. Now, the questions are his size. He is small. And the Timberwolves are a defensive team. But that could help him because he's small. But look who they have around him. Rudy Gobert, Anthony Edwards, Jaden McDaniels. Those are three amazing defenders. Two of those guys... Gobert and McDaniels are all defensive type players. Anthony Edwards is on the track to be an all defensive type player. So, you know, he might get picked on, but he has if he has Rudy Gobert back there, at least in the regular season, <laughs> he's going to be able to block some shots. He'll be okay. But he comes off the bench right away, becomes a microwave scorer. This guy is going to be the highlight reel of the draft. There's always one player that they pick that's going to be on every highlight reel of stuff. It's going to be Rob Dillingham this year, especially in Minnesota, where they're going to have a lot of TV games. Rob Dillingham is going to be that guy. And I'm, I am I love Rob Dillingham. I hope he goes over to Minnesota and kills it. Um, him and Anthony Edwards, that's going to be a lot of bucket getting, a lot of highlights on ESPN over there. So for me, this pick gets an A-. minus. Minnesota. Minnesota sneaks out with Rob Dillingham, man. That's kind of crazy. That, that That's that's kind of crazy. Um, Next, another very shocking pick. This honestly was a lot more shocking picks than I would have expected in this draft. But... The Memphis Grizzlies take Zach Eady at number nine. There was a rumor that came out, I think, the day before. I think I want to say on Wednesday or, no, Tuesday, 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 um, that Zach Eady potentially could be, you know, going to Portland at seven. And I was like, whoa. Like, I didn't even, Zach Eady going to the top ten didn't even cross my mind at any point. 
Um, but I was like, no way, right? And the Memphis Grizzlies say, you know what? We need a center. The Grizzlies were a team, obviously, really trying to go get Donovan Kling. I thought that would have been a perfect pick. There were talks about them moving up to three for Houston to get Donovan Kling, and that didn't work. And so they say, you know what? We're, we need a center, and we're going to do anything in, in our power to get a center. So give us the seven foot four, 300 pound dude in Zach Eady. Um, of course, Eady, if you watch college basketball, you know who Zach Eady is. He was argue, you can argue he's been the best player in college basketball the last couple of years. Um, really improved his game. Went from an unrecruited center to, again, a two time AP player of the year, which is historic. Um, he's got, I mean, inside scoring, he can do that. He's got good touch and feel as well. Very solid passer. And then defensively, he's seven foot four with a 7'10 wingspan. That's all you really need to say. Um, this pick, though, for Memphis, personally, for me, I'm giving this pick a B- minus for a couple reasons. Number one, I think you could have moved back. I think Uzaki was going to be there if he was at like 13, 14. Edie was going to be there. I don't think who was after the Jazz or like the Kings were going to take Zach Edie. I think you could have moved back for this pick um, for one. And number two, I understand. I understand it for the Grizzlies because they need some size and why not just get a seven foot four guy? I understand that. But I don't know if he's the right big man. Um, the questions for him really are, can he play a fast-paced style of game? Where there's times in college where they started to move the tempo up and get fast-paced, and Zach Eady didn't look as good as he usually did. And the Grizzlies are a team that you have John Morant, so automatically you're going to be a fast-paced team. So I don't know how well he's going to fit there. Um, in terms of that, that's really the question, is like how he's going to fit there and how he's going to translate to our role. Because in Memphis... In the NBA, whoever he was going to get drafted, his role was going to be not similar to what he was at Purdue. At Purdue, he was the number one option. It was give the ball to Zach Eady in the post and get out of the way and be ready to catch a pass and get ready to run back. It was him in the post for 10 seconds trying to make a hook shot, really, or getting fouled and getting to the free throw line. In the NBA, his role is going to be to Don McClingan, what he did at UConn. His role is going to be set screens, rim run, block shots and do that and so we didn't really see him play that type of role at purdue so how really is that going to work i don't really know so b minus for memphis i think there's a there's a real a re very realistic world that it does work out and i'm overthinking it and he finds a way to be able to play with pace and stuff like that which if he does that's awesome but i just don't know if this was the right center for the grizzlies I, again i understand them going after it i understand it i i, I completely understand it but I just don't really know if this is the right guy for them. I, I really don't know. Um, next, we're going to Utah. Cody Williams at number 10. Little, J-Dub's little bro goes number 10. Um, he personally was my, I think, number 10 or number 7 or 8 on the big board. Um, I had him going to Portland in my mind drive. I thought that was a perfect pick. But he ends up falling because Portland takes Donovan Klingon. And he falls to number 10 to the Utah Jazz. Um, I personally think this is an amazing pick. I'm going A. I think this is a great pick for Utah. Um, Utah already has a lot of guards. You have Keontae George, who I'm really high on. I really think Keontae George is going to be an amazing player. You still have Collins Section and Jordan Clarkson. You know, you draft the Bryce Sensiball, who's probably like a two or three, maybe. And then after that, you know, you have a lot of openness at the wing, you know? So I think Cody Williams is a great pick. I think he's going to be a really good player, very efficient scorer at. Colorado, guy that doesn't really need the ball in his hands. He's very solid in catch, shoot, cutting, and playing off the ball. He's really solid at. Um, he's got defensive potential as well. As I think he's six seven with a seven one wingspan. Who who's gonna pass that up? And he's just a very high IQ basketball player that knows how to get hit, get in where he fits in, um, with a high ceiling as well. He has the potential to be kind of similar to what his brother is at U OKC, where at first he was kind of like a good all around glue guy type of dude that fits in, and now he's could potentially be an all-star at one point. I think Cody Williams can have a very similar career trajectory where he comes in first and he's kind of like a do-it-all little glue guy. And then in two or three years from now, we look at him and be like, dang, Cody Williams is like an amazing player, you know, averaging 17 in the league or something like that. I think Cody Williams can legitimately do that. And I think going to Utah, that's an amazing spot where there's no one going to be really in front of him. Also, they play a really good team-style ball, so he's going to get in there. And they have good defenders already. Like, I think this is an amazing pick for Utah. To get able to get a guy like this, Cody Williams, at number 10, I think that's an amazing pick for Utah. So that's an A 
for me personally. That's an A. That, that's that's a great pick. Um, now we're going back, going to the Chi Town, going to Chi Town with the Chicago Bulls. They take the hometown kid, Matas Buzelis, from the G League Ignite, goes number twelve or eleven. Sorry to the Chicago Bulls. Um, I personally had him going number five to the Detroit Pistons. Um, he was a guy that once again similar to very, very similar to Ron Holland, where coming out of high school with the class he was a projected maybe number one overall pick went to the g league the ignite in general were just bad which is why they're canceling the g league ignite because they're bad and didn't have an amazing year the ignite in general didn't have an amazing year it kind of stock dropped it dropped his stock he didn't have a good shooting year and he fell a little bit and now he ends up to chicago at 11 i also am giving this an a pick um when i did my mock drafts for the bulls they were one of the hardest ones to do because i thought Montez was going to be gone by then I thought Matos was going to be gone. I thought he was going to be number five to Detroit. I thought it made sense. And they always ended up getting either reaching for a big man or just getting like a spacing guy like Jacoby Walter for me. And I think this is better than what they expected. To get a guy like Matos Buzelz who has a ceiling to potentially be a top five pick in this draft. He's got a lot of two-way potential. You don't have a lot of wing players around. Like after DeMar and who knows what happens to Patrick Williams, who are their wings? Torrey Craig? I'm like, okay. Like, they don't really have that. So being able to have a guy with young potential at the wing like Matas, a guy, again, has two-way potential. He's got good size. He's 6'10", but can play like a wing. Could play the three, the two, maybe even the four. Uh, if he adds strength, it's one of his big things. He needs to add on some more strength, but he's 19 years old. He's probably going to do that. Um, he's got good two-way potential, good shot-making ability. He made a lot of tough shots in the G League Ignite. Um, the three-point shot, he had an off three-point shooting year, but usually he had been a good three-point shooter in high school. G League, he had a bad shooting year. But I'm buying into Matas Buzelis. I think this is an amazing pick for the Bulls. The Bulls need young talent, and Matas Buzelis is young talent. And he gets to go home. Who doesn't we just want to go home and play for their hometown team? The emotion you saw from him was amazing. He got to be got, get to go back home. So that that's awesome. So Matas to the Bulls, firstly for me, gets an A. We're going to speed up a little bit because we're 41 minutes in, and we're not even out of the lottery. But, you know, um, I think we're trying. we're going to try to go a little bit faster. Um, next pick we got is the 12. OKC Thunder select Nikola Topic out of Serbia because why not? Why not? This is just... The Thunder came on and personally, I'm jealous of the OKC Thunder because they just have everything. You know, like you have a good team, good superstar, good coach. You have 35 draft picks. You have salary cap. Just, you know, like they just, they have everything. A good GM. Like, they, they have everything, man. It, it's, it, yeah, they have everything. So why not just go take a guy that was projected top five and you could just stash him? He's probably not going to play next year because he has the ACL injury. So, and they're like, you know what? We already have a good team. We don't really need him to come around right now. Let's draft the guy that has top five potential. Let, let's do that. They get an A minus. Uh, I don't. I only get an A minus because I don't know how the fit works. Topic is not a guy that shoots the ball well yet. Um, he's an amazing ball handler. Could be a Josh Giddy replacement. Uh, a good, really good ball handler. Probably a great pick and roll player. Him and Chet pick and roll is going to be nice when that happens. Uh, he loves to get to the rim as well. Very, not very athletic. Or when you watch him on tape, you're not going to be blown away by his athleticism and scoring. But he knows how to get to the rim and score crafty around the basket. Really, the only question is the three-point shooting and the health. He's had a couple injuries this year, so the health is a concern and the jump shot. But if you're OKC, you don't really care because you don't need him to play next year. You don't need him to play next year. You have Shea, you have Alex Caruso, you have Kaysen Wallace, you have Lou Dor, you have Jalen Williams, you have Chet Holmgren. Um, you probably can go sign a center. You just you have everything you want in an organization. So why not just take a guy that could be a top five pick and take him at 12 and just stash him for a year while we wait for him to get healthy? Because I'm, I'm jealous of the OKC. The Thunder have everything, man. Like, they get, they got to have something wrong with them. Like, this is crazy. I sound like I'm glazing the Thunder right now. I'm not a Thunder fan. Uh, but I, if I was right now, I would be on cloud nine. Um, 13, Sacramento Kings, Devin Carter. This was one of my few... Guys that I, pre that I had in my mock draft that actually panned out. Devin Carter to Sacramento. I think this is an amazing pick for the Sacramento Kings. I think this is the great pick to go. Um, Devin Carter. Um, by the way, I'm giving it an A. I'm giving it an A. 
Love this pick. I think this was a, a perfect pick for Sacramento. Uh, the Kings, Devin Carter's a guy that's going to come in, and he, he fits a role. He comes off the Sacramento Kings bench, which was not as amazing as it was the year before, last year, even though they kept Malik Monk, which is an amazing move. Devin Carter is going to come in. Defense, he's going to lock in there. Sacramento is not an amazing perimeter defensive type of team. Devin Carter comes in and he fits defensively. He's going to bring intensity. 6'3 with a 6'8 wingspan. He blocked a lot of shots, got a lot of steals, got in the passing lanes, got on transition. Like defensively, he's going to be great. And he's also a guy you could put with De'Aaron Fox. He's a guy that doesn't really need the ball in his hands a whole lot. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how his position works out in the NBA. Is he a point guard or is he a two? You know? Like he has the size of a point guard, but he's not an amazing ball handler or playmaker that you would want as a point guard. So I don't really know how that's going to kind of work out. But with the Kings, uh, you already have De'Aaron Fox. So even if it doesn't work out, you're good. They also they traded away Davion Mitchell t today earlier to the Toronto Raptors to clear up some cap space because they're also trying to go get a big move. I think this is an amazing pick. This is a pick that is great for the Kings. Um, I love it. Give it an A. One that I also mocked over, and it worked out. One of the rare ones in a very chaotic draft. Um, and now this is where I talk a lot more more because i have some things to say about this next one i have some things to say um not about the pick not about the pick but about some of the things surrounding this pick um the washington wizards are 14 they take bub carrington out of pittsburgh one of the young guys in the draft um and before i get into the pick and before i get into bub carrington i want to talk about how bad the washington wizards organization is for a second because this was originally the Portland Trailblazers pick. This was the Portland Trailblazers pick. They got him. They got it from the Golden State Warriors. I don't remember how. But somehow the Warriors pick ended up in Portland. And about an hour before the draft, I see a tweet from Adrian Wojnarowski, the GOAT, Woj, that says the Washington Wizards are trading Denny Avdia to the Portland Trailblazers for Malcolm Brogdon, the 14th pick, a 2029 pick, and a second or two seconds. And I say, what are the Washington Wizards doing? Let's, like, what are we, what are they doing? I'm not a Wizards fan, but I was mad like a Wizards fan. And a lot of Wizards fans were mad. And this is just, this was like, Denny of Dia was, I'm not even kidding. Denny of Dia, you can make an argument, he was the second best Washington Wizard last year. Denny Avdia had a career year last year. He was amazing. He's 23. He, you just paid him last offseason. And you trade him for the 14th pick in Malcolm Brogdon? Really? And you get Bub Carrington. Um, I'll talk about Bub Carrington in a second because I like Bub Carrington. But I'm just, I'm still trying to wrap my head around. The more and more I think about it, the more and more it doesn't make sense that the Wizards traded Denny Avdia. Like, hold on, I'm going to go full screen for a second because it's going to make me th seem like I'm talking about Bob Kane. I'm not talking about Bob Kane. I'm talking about the Washington Wizards. Let me sit up. Um, I feel so small. Um, why? Why? Let's go through the reasons why he might get traded. Number one, money. But, no, you signed him to a four-year $55 million contract next year, which looks like an amazing contract. So his contract isn't up, and he's not getting overpaid. He's probably getting underpaid. So that's one. Two, he clashes with other players. You have Bilal Kolobali. They can play together. Bilal Kolobali and Danny do not overlap each other at all. And anything, you could put them together and create a, a monster defensive wing, you know, unit. So, number two. All right. Um, what's next? Number three, an offer you can't refuse. Was this an offer you can't refuse? Malcolm Brogdon, the 14th pick, and two seconds? Really? This was an offer that you said, we can't refuse this. We need this offer right now on the table. You know? Like, is it? Like, I just, I don't understand. Did he have, is he having a bad year? No, he had a career year. Number four. Like, is he struggling? He had a career year last year. He was your second best player. I, I, I still, I don't understand what the Washington Wizards are thinking trading Danny of Dia. I don't understand. For Portland, this, this was amazing. This is a fleece. <laughs> this is a fleece. Like, you get 
You the only thing you give up Malcolm Brogdon, who's gonna get traded anyway. A twenty twenty nine pick, who knows? Two seconds, eh. And the fourteenth pick, which let's be honest. Look at look at go back. I, I did this yesterday too. Go back through the last since twenty ten, maybe. Twenty fifteen. Look at the 14th pick in every draft and see how many pan out to be good NBA players. It's not it's not great. The 14th overall pick usually is not a historically amazing pick. You get some here and there. Of course, with every pick, there's anomalies and stuff. You get one or two every couple of years, like maybe 17 overall picks that work out. But most of the time, after like 10 in the draft, from 10 to like 15, it's kind of like, a, all right. Like, you project this got to be good, but you could miss, you know? Like, after, honestly, outside the top 10, really just kind of like a shot in the dark. It's like, who knows? You're not banking on any of these guys to be superstars. But if you can get a good rotational player, good starter, that's cool. If you get an all-star, great. If you get a superstar, hey, you look like geniuses. But the 14th overall pick is not something that's like super valuable in a sense of like you trade Denny of Dia for it. I just don't understand. But to Bub Carrington, Bub Carrington is the guy that I got picked. And personally, for me, I gave this pick an A minus. Bub Carrington is the guy that I really like. He's got a lot of people like. He's another guy that could be a highlight reel. One of the youngest players in the draft at 18. Um, he's a bucket getter. Bucket getter. Loves to get in the mid range and go get buckets. He's a really good playmaker as well. Um, the only thing is the three point shot is not amazing yet. Um, and he's still, again, very, very young. He's still 18. But I like this for the Wizards. Again, the Wizards are a team that just, they need any piece of talent they can get. And so why not go get a guy like this that can be a bucket getter, playmaker, and with the right development, he, he can be a really, really good player. And you get a PG that you don't really have. You have Ty Jones, but let's, he's not part of the top. He's not part of the long-term plans. So I, I think it's an A- pick. I think it's a great pick for the Wizards. But it's just to get to give up Denny of Dia. I, I still don't understand. I'm never gonna understand why they gave up Denny of Dia, man. I, I really don't understand why. But they did it, so well well. Uh next one. This is an interesting pick for me. Miami Heat take Kalel Ware out of Indiana at fifteen. This was not something I was expecting at all. Um This yeah, this was not something I was expecting. And honestly, this is another reason why I think I did. I like that I did this now instead of live during the draft, even though it would have been awesome to live react to these picks. Um, and hopefully next year we can do that. But at first, I'm going I'm to be completely honest with you. At first, when I saw that the Heat were taking Kalel Ware, I didn't like it. I, I didn't like it at first. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I didn't like this pick. I was like, really? Especially when you had guys like Jared McCain, um, Tristan De Silva on the board, guys that feel like they fit the Heat better, and Tristan De Silva is a Heat culture dude. Jerry McCain feels a real need for spacing, and they take Khalil Ware, who probably is a little bit of a project. I, I didn't really like it at first, but the more and more I think about it, the more and more I'm kind of like, you know what? This isn't a horrible pick. Um, I'm I'm giving it a B minus. I think they could have gone many different ways, and if I was Pat Riley and the Heat personally, I wouldn't have went with Khalil Ware, but I can kind of see it. Um, he's a guy that you has, I mean, he's seven foot with like a seven, four wingspan pogo stick type center guy. that's going to be a lob threat and block shots. He's going to do that. And he has the intriguing skill of the three point shot, which is why he's very intriguing. He has the three point shot. Potentially that could be a thing for him. And he's got a high ceiling, which is why he's really intriguing. I feel like he's one of those guys where a lot of people are love him or a lot of people don't really like him. And I was kind of in the middle, <laughs> which is crazy. But I was kind of in the middle. Like I kind, of, I could see it, but I also wasn't the biggest Kilo Ware guy coming in, looking at my big boards. I think I had him at twenty in my big boards, and I had him going, I think, to the Raptors at nineteen. Or no, I think I had him in the twenties, maybe. I don't fully remember what I had in my mock draft for him. But I, I, at first, I didn't really like this pick. But now I'm thinking more about about it. The Heat. I mean, to get a guy like Kilo Ware, a guy. That, projects to be a good you know lob threat shot blocker rim runner guy that can shoot the three potentially guy that can play next to bam maybe with bam size maybe him and bam if the three-point shot develops him and bam can play next to each other um and he's got potential you know and honestly i also 
this might be a crazy reason to think why you know this pick grew on me a little bit. But if there's one organization and one GM that you trust to make these picks, it's Pat Riley himself. So if Pat Riley's backing him, if Pat Riley is saying, you know what, we love this guy and we think this guy's gonna be good, then you know what? Who am I to uh, who am I to disrespect and question Pat Riley's mind? So okay, B minus for me, blow. I think it could have been better. Now, this is going to be the complete opposite. Jared McCain to the Sixers at 16. This has potential. This honestly, this honestly might be my favorite pick of the NBA draft. I'm going to be so honest. This might be my favorite pick. Jared McCain, I think he had a great year at Duke. You know, uh, he's a guy that played, played really well at Duke. A shooter, sharp shooter. Um, he's going to compete all over the court. Um, he's a guy that can play on the ball and off the ball. He potentially could have some backup point guard qualities as well. This is an A+. Plus. Again, I think this could be the best pick of the draft. I love this for Philly. I love this pick. He's a guy that can play with Tyrese Maxey, together with Tyrese Maxey, and Joel Embiid and space the floor. And also, maybe could be could have some backup point guard minutes when Tyrese Maxey's off the court, I think. Um, he already was at Duke with a loaded team, so he knows how to play there. Um, just you know, Also, I'm a big fan of Jeremy King. He's just a guy that he, he doesn't really care what people think about him, you know? Like, there's so much people that I think hate on him a little bit for some reason with the TikTok videos and the fingernail painting and stuff. Like, honestly, I think I don't mind it at all. I think he's just, I mean, I, I respect it. I respect him. He's a guy that he comes out and he's like, he's him. He does him no matter what, no matter what people say. And I, I really respect that a whole lot. Um, so, yeah, I'm a Jeremy Kane guy. I think this is, an, again, perfect pick. A plus. Amazing pick for the Sixers. Amazing, amazing pick. I think this guy that's going to come in right away and be able to you know, contribute. He's going to be able to contribute. Um, next, we got another pick that I really, really, really liked. Um, we're going to go with the 17th overall pick. Don't Connect ends up with the LA Lakers. Who would have saw that coming? Um, by the way, before I even get into it, this also gets an A-plus for me. Um, Don't Connect was a guy that I had top 10 in my big board. I think a lot of people had him as a top 10, at least a lottery pick. And he falls all the way to 17, apparently. Some people are concerned with his age. He is 23 years old. And he has some injury problems in the past. So people kind of didn't really mess with that a whole lot. And the Lakers end up getting him at 17. I mean, I think even the Lakers, I think, themselves were shocked that they ended up getting him. And this this is an amazing pick for the Lakers. Um, you can argue he was one of the he was he well not even argue he was one of the best college basketball players last year. A guy that I think started in JUCO, went to D two, D one. Like he's a guy that grinded all the way to get up to Tennessee and become SEC Player of the Year last year. Um, older, twenty three. He's experienced. He's seasoned a little bit, and he comes into a Laker team that's trying to win now, and I think he fits right away. Um, a guy that can be a connector offensively. He can shoot the ball very well with some scoring potential. A uh, really good offensive player, and he can fit next to LeBron and AD right away, personally. He's not going to be a guy that, you know, the Lakers draft kind of like maybe similar to Jalen Shafino, Max Christie, where they're very young, still have a lot of development to do, and probably is going to wait on the bench for two or three years. Don't connect, come in right away and play, you know, from day one. And the Lakers being able to get, a, again, a guy that was projected top 10 at 17, who wouldn't love that? So I think for the Lakers, that's an A+. Plus. That might be the steal of the draft. We can, we might, that might be a pick we look back on a couple years and we're like, dang, how did the Lakers end up getting Don Connect? You know, like how? Like, I think that that's an amazing pick, personally for me. Um, yeah, be able to get a top 10 guy at 17, um, Don Connect. Laker Nation, Laker Nation, you should be super, super excited about Don Connect. Um, next, we're going to go to number 18. The Orlando Magic tri picked up Tristan De Silva out of Colorado. The Civil is one of my guys I really like in this draft. Um, another experienced guy. I think he's about 23 years old already. Um, Four-year guy. And I think he's, he's just a, a really good basketball player at the end of the day. Really good basketball player. High IQ. Guy's going to be able to space the floor. He's going to shoot. He's versatile. He can pass the ball. He can defend. He can play off the ball. Like He's, he's just, again, a really sound, high IQ basketball player. And he gets an A minus for me, for the Magic, uh, for the Magic at this point, you know. Of course, you would want spacing and guards play, 
Um, there were guys up there. But most likely you want to get those over agency. And you don't want to bring another young guard when you drafted Anthony Black and Jet Howard last year. Bringing in another, drafting another guard just wouldn't have made a lot of sense. So getting a guy at the forward position that can come in and play, he's not going to really mess up the chemistry or need the ball. He can play well off the ball. He can shoot. He can be versatile. Another 6'9 guy you add to that team. And a seasoned, experienced guy. I think this is an amazing pick. This is a great pick for the Magic. Tristan Silva, honestly, I I said in my mock drafts and stuff, I thought Tristan Silva was a guy that was going to be a lottery pick. I think I projected him at number 12 to OKC. And you get him at 18. I think this is a, a great value pick. I think he's a guy that could be able to, he's going to be able to stay around the league for a long time. Personally for me. I, I'm a big Tristan De Silva fan. I think this is a great pick for the Orlando Magic. They get an A- minus from me. Um, we're moving up. We're, we're moving pretty good right now. Moving pretty good. Um, now we're going to the 19th overall pick. Jacoby Walter out of Baylor. The Toronto Raptors pick him up. Um, this was Jacoby Walter. Um, I think early in the year was a guy that projected around top 10. Kind of fell a little bit as the season went on. Still very young. Still 19 years old, I want to say. Um, but he's got a lot of potential. Personally for me, this gets an A- minus for the Raptors. This gets an A- for me. He fits a Raptor mold type player. 6'5", six, 6'10", six, wingspan, length. Um, has some defensive potential. He has to get a lot better at it. But he has a lot of defensive potential with his size and frame and length. So you have that. And space the floor. The Raptors don't really have a lot of floor spacers. And Kobe Walter does that. He's going to come right away and be a 3 and D guy. You know, you want him to be a 3 and D guy. He's going to come in right away and shoot the 3. He kind of gives me... He gives me Buddy Heald vibes for some reason, even though I don't really know if Buddy Heald's a good comparison. But I don't know. He just gives me Buddy Heald, that type of mole play. Guys, like guys that are going to take a lot of threes and can be solid defensively. And I think the Raptors need players like that. And I think this is a really good pick for the Raptors, you know, especially with how young they are going and young they're getting. Get another guy that can space with Scotty and RJ and IQ and get some more shooting in there, space the floor out, you know. Next... Is my team, my team, the Cleveland Cavaliers. If you don't know, I'm a Cavs fan. Um, I mention it sometimes, but not a lot because I, at the end of the day, I'm just a whole NBA fan. I just love the league in general, but the Cavs are my team. Cavaliers select Jalen Tyson out of Cali, California, with the 20th overall pick. Um, Jalen Tyson is a guy, personally for me, where the more and more I watched him on a film, the more and more I loved him. The more and more I watched, the more and more I was a big fan and could get behind a Jalen Tyson type of guy. Um, and for the Cavaliers, I think this is a B plus. Um, I think it's a B plus pick. Uh, Tyson is a guy who's been around college basketball a little bit. Another experienced guy. I think he's about 21, 22 years old. Um, I think he's a guy that whatever he's asked to do, he's going to do it. I love the in intensity, the attitude, the motor he has for one thing. I like that a lot. Um, yeah, I think he's a guy that's going to come in, and if whatever you ask him to do, he's going to do it. You need him to be a shooter, he's going to do it. You need him to handle the ball and play make, he can do it. You need him to defend, he's going to do it, you know. Um, he's one of those Swiss Army knife, I feel like, type of guys um, that can do a little bit of everything. And I think for the Cavaliers, they don't really have players like that, especially coming off the bench. I don't think we have a lot of players that can come off the bench and be Swiss Army knives. Karis LeVert, who knows what you're going to get from Karis LeVert. One night he's going to give you 28. One night he's going to give you two. You never know where you're going to have a Karis LeVert. Isaac Okoro, amazing defender offensively. Teams are allowing him to shoot. Then after that, you got like George Niang is a guy that if he's not shooting the three, he's not doing much else. Dean Wade is okay, I guess. But they don't really have a lot of Swiss Army Knife guys that are going to come off the bench and make impacts in many other ways. And I think Jalen Tyson can do that. Jalen Tyson is a guy that's going to come in and he's going to make impacts in many other ways. So I really like this pick for the Cavaliers. I love it. I'm a fan. Jalen, welcome to the land, brother. And let's hope you come in and do your thing. I'm rooting for you, bro. Um, we're heading to the late first round now. Um, next pick we got is the New Orleans Pelicans. It's like Eves Missy. Pick another Baylor guy. Uh, pick out of Baylor. Um, Missy is very Clint Capella like. This draft leaves Missy as a Clint Capella prototype player. Again, I said it earlier. 
If you don't have a Jokic or Embiid center, you want a center that's going to rebound, lob threat, set screens, and block shots. And Eves Missy does that. A uh, very physical, very athletic, um, very athletic, big. He set a lot, catch a lot of lobs. Baylor set a lot of lob plays up for him, and he went up and got them. So he's going to be a lob threat. Um, big guy that's going to rebound. I think he was one of the more safer picks because I feel like he's going to come in and do his thing. You know what you're getting from him, and he's going to come in and do it at a good level. And I think that the Pelicans, with Jonas Valanciunas potentially leaving this offseason, I think, you know, of course, the ideal big for them is a spacing big next to Zion. But if you don't get a spacing big, you know what? Then let's just get a big big. If we're, if we're not going to get a spacing big, let's just get a big that's going to rebound, clean up, that's going to be on cleanup duty. Lob threat is going to rebound and block shots. Let's just get that type of big, which is why I projected them to take Zach Eady, you know, sometimes. But they take Eve's Missy. I think this is a really good pick. I didn't give the grade. I got B plus. I feel like this was a very odd pick because I feel like they could go so many ways. I wouldn't be surprised if they took Isaiah Collier. Wouldn't be surprised if they took Kyle Filipowski, Eve's Missy. Could they take another shooter, Johnny Furphy? Like, uh, who knows? So the Pelicans had just a pick where I feel like it was just kind of like up and down. I don't know what they're really going to do. They can do a lot of different things. They end up going with Eve's Missy. I think he's a really good player. And I think this is a good pick for them. Um, next, we're going to 22. The Phoenix Suns originally had this pick, traded this pick to the Denver Nuggets so the Nuggets can select Deron Holmes out of Dayton. Big man. Um, Deron Holmes, a guy that spent a lot of time in college. He's about 21, 22 years old. Um, was in the draft process last year. Decided to come back to Dayton for another year and had a really good year. Uh, center that's, first of all, going to bring a lot of in energy and intensity. Watch how when he, when he got selected, the energy he had, he didn't no more slapped his older bro his younger brother. <laughs> like, he was like super hyped up. And that's who he is. And I like that a whole lot. Um, he brings energy and intensity already off the bat. And I think for the Nuggets, he goes to a really good situation. Goes to a situation where he's going to play behind Nicole Jokic, so he doesn't really need to do much. If he could just give him five good minutes, five solid minutes of basketball, he did his job. You know, um, Might be a little bit undersized, potentially, height-wise for a center. He's about 6'9", 6 6'10". 6 but high IQ offensive player. He can score in well inside. He's a solid passer. You know, Defensively, he's a good shot blocker. He's got good length. For his side, you know, the jump shot. He added a jump shot. I don't know how real it's going to be, but he added it. Um, and he goes to Denver. I think this is B, the B pick, you know. Not an amazing, amazing pick. I thought maybe they would have went another way with it, to be perfectly honest with you. But definitely not a horrible pick for the Nuggets. Why not just get some more depth for uh, Nikola Jokic? Just get, get Jokic some more depth so he can sit maybe an extra minute or two longer. Honestly, now we're going to get to another pick that I'm going to talk a lot about. Um, 23. This was probably the surprise of the NBA draft. And people don't even know it's surprised because they don't know who this guy is. <laughs> um, the Milwaukee Bucks, like AJ Johnson, 23rd from the NBL. He played over with the Hawks of how do you pronounce that word? Um, the mellow ball went there as well. He played there before going to the NBA draft. Um, he, on my draft board, where I had AJ Johnson, I had AJ Johnson 56th. I had him 56. I didn't do a mock draft for the second round, but if I did, I probably would have had him in the mid 40s, early 50s, maybe. The Bucks take a chance at him at 23. Um, there's a couple things I want to talk about this pick. Number one, the Bucks have a se had a second round pick that I think they used and they took Tyler Smith, 33. They, they could have took him to 33. They could have waited. I don't think anybody was picking him in the first round, AJ Johnson. They could have waited for their second round pick. Number one. Number two, and the main reason that I, I don't like this pick, and I'm giving this pick ultimately a C-. minus. I think this was the worst pick of the first round, I think, for the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, personally, the Bucks needed a guy that's going to plug in and play right away. But I thought a guy like Jalen Tyson, I had them mocked. Kevin McCuller, Terrence Shannon, 
a guy like that that's going to come in right away and can make an impact his rookie year, a more seasoned, experienced veteran, college guy. I thought that was the pick to go. That was the move to make. A guy's going to plug in and play. You don't have a lot of young players. You're the oldest team in the league. You don't have a lot of young players that are come out off the bench and do something. And getting a guy like that would have been perfect. Um, I think that was the move. And they go the complete opposite. The goal with Aiden Johnson, a guy that is very raw. He's still 18, very raw. And Polly, honestly, is not going to get a, probably not going to be able to play for another two years. Like, he didn't really have a good year overseas, didn't play a whole lot. Like, it's still, I think he's 100. He's like my weight. Like, really? And, you know, if you know me, I'm a very small guy. So, like, he's, he's like 160 pounds. Like, he's not going to be ready for another year or two. He doesn't have one skill. I feel like that's, like, his top skill. I mean, he's a good ball handler, and he has good length. But I don't, I should, I think they, they fumbled this pick. The Bucks fumbled this pick. They went with upside when they didn't need to go for upside. They could have got this guy 30. They could have traded into, like, the 45th pick and selected him if they really liked him that bad. But they end up going with him at 23. I just, uh, I don't like this pick. C- minus for me. Because... I give it a C minus and not an F because personally for me, after it gets to like 18 maybe, I don't think there's such thing as a bad pick in the draft. This came very close. <laughs> if there was a bad pick, this was it. This came very, very close. But personally, I don't think such thing as this after the lottery maybe as a bad pick because I think after the lottery, it's kind of just like a shot in the dark. It's just, I don't, it's just, I, this wasn't the pick at 23, personally. This wasn't the pick at 23. Am I wrong? If I'm wrong, I mean, I'm rooting for AJ Johnson. I hope he does good. I hope he proves everybody wrong and proves me wrong and makes me look stupid. But it's just, I don't, I, so the Wizards have come up and get their guy in Keyshawn George out of Miami. He's a guy that was a late riser, that's comfortable handing the ball like him, that can shoot the three ball like him, and has some potential defensively at 6'7 with a 6'10 wingspan. He's got length, size, his skill set for his size and his age is very, very intriguing. I'm surprised, honestly, he didn't go a little bit earlier, potentially. The Wizards end up taking him at 24. I think this is an A pick. I think it's a good pick. I think, honestly, the Wizards didn't trade Denny of Dia. The Wizards might have been the winner of the NBA draft. You get Alex Saar, who probably was the number one guy in this draft, at number two. Bub Carrington at 14, a high upside pick at 18 that already is skilled. And they've got like Keyshawn George that you can take a pick on that has a high upside as well. That has a really that could be a really, really good player. If they did not trade, trade like Pittsburgh for me. Um is this Mike Morgan? Yeah, okay. I was filming something and the mic was like being weird, so hopefully it hasn't done that. I've been checking and the mic has been good. But hopefully the mic hasn't been like super odd or anything. I'm using a handheld as well because um my mic stand is my next my next investment is mic stand. Because it's not good, so I'm hold, I'm holding the mic, you know, um, for filming other content. But so I think yeah, Wizards. Went up again. Next take, Bacom Dade out of the out of France. Another Frenchman in this draft. Um, guys are really George did, but he did rise up draft boards a lot. Um, a Frenchman, six foot eight, can handle the ball well for his size. Um, can get. Similar to Keyshawn George, another 6'8 ball handler um, that can potentially shoot the ball, could potentially be a shot creator as well. He's probably not going to come over to the NBA right away. And for the Knicks, you don't really need him to come over because you have Mikael Bridges. You have a super team you're building right now. And whoever was going to get picked with this 25 and 26 pick wasn't going to play this year. Let's be honest. Not going to play this year. So they could take a chance on a guy like Bacom and stash him for a year. And if he comes over, he does. If not, then okay. Who's the 25th pick? Whatever. 
Um, I give it a B plus. I think he has high potential. Uh, a guy, kind of to Keyshawn George, a guy that with his size at six foot eight that can handle the ball the way he can, that can create the shots potentially like he can. I think it's a really, really good pick. I'm feel so small. I feel like I'm going smaller and smaller. I'm going shorter and shorter. I feel like every time uh, I talk about a pick, but I think Bacom Daddy at twenty five to the Knicks. I think is is a solid. Again, they don't really need him to come over right away right now. You know? Like they, they don't really need him at all, <laughs> to be honest. They don't need him. <laughs> he's he's kind of just there. Uh twenty six, the OKC Thunder. Take Dylan Jones. This originally was the Wizards pick. The Wizards flipped up the Knicks for twenty four and twenty six. The Knicks flipped this pick to OKC and they got five second round picks. Um because why not? The Thunder just have picks to spare. The Thunder can just throw you five seconds. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I'm saying with the Thunder have everything. Thunder could just throw you five seconds, and it doesn't matter at all. But the Thunder, throw five seconds to the Knicks. Go get their guy, Dylan Jones. Um, Dylan Jones is one of the most interesting prospects in this draft because of how odd of, of a player he is. He's about a six foot five guard, forward. I don't know. He's He's got the body of a power forward, but he plays like a point guard. And kind of does everything like a wing. He, he's, a, he's a very odd player. You know. Um, he's a guy that I think at Weber State led his team in like every stat. You know. He was a, like a. I think he averaged like 20, 10 in, or 29 in like 5 or something. Like he was like constantly on triple double watch. He did everything really for his team. You know. Um, whether it's getting to the paint, being a bully ball. He did that. Creating for himself in the mid range, he did that. Catch and shoot threes, he did that. Defensively, he did that. Handled the ball and playing for others, he did that. He did everything at Weber State, and he's gonna be. It's gonna be very interesting to see. I'm very interested to see how he transitions. The role he's gonna play, how he's gonna play in the Knicks. A three and D guy, probably gonna be a guy that's gonna catch and shoot and defend. Um, but he does have again the ball handling ability and stuff where he's needs he's needed to handle the ball. He potentially. So personally, I, I give it a B. Um, I didn't have him go in the first round, but again, at this point in the draft, it does bot big boards and stuff don't really matter a whole lot. It's just about who you want and who you think is going to be able to translate to your team very well. Um, but I think it's a B. I'm very interested in Dylan Jones though. Um, he is a good pro- a favorite prospect of mine just because he's so odd, and I want to see how he translates to the NBA. If you don't watch Dylan, go watch Dylan Jones that we were saying. You'll understand what I'm seeing. I mean, like it's so crazy to see him play because he's like. He has the body of like PJ Tucker, but he's playing like, like a big point guard. I don't know. He's playing like a big like Penny Hardaway. <laughs> like it's just it's a very interesting pick. But the Thunder take him. Um, next, Minnesota back on the clock, twenty seven. They take Terrence Shannon Jr. out of Illinois. Um, Terrence Shannon was really good last year. At Illinois. He's a guy that's been around college basketball for a while. I remember his name from. He was, I think he was a top high school player in his class, and then he's been around. Things haven't really worked out, but he ended up in Illinois. He was really good at Illinois last year. Uh, he's a two-guard that plays with a lot of intensity um, on both ends. Loves to play in transition. If you get him in transition, he's a he's a bulldog in transition. He loves to get in transition, get fouled, get to the free throw line, score in the paint. Really solid shooter. Was a solid playmaker as well. Um, as, or he has an NBA-ready body. Uh, there's a lot of good things about Terrence Shannon. Or really, the question is really for me, at least, is what is his ceiling, you know, and how well is he going to play off the ball in the NBA? Because Illinois kind of was the main guy, main ball handler, and all that stuff, and he played make for everybody and stuff. So I don't know how he's going to look in the NBA, but he ends up going to Minnesota, which I think is a really nice pick for them, and I give it a B plus. Um, I think he's going to be able to match the intensity and match the energy in Minnesota with his intensity. He's going to be able to block in defensively, especially as many great defenders around him. And he does have a big role in Minnesota. All he really needs to do is come in, play a couple of minutes of good defense, and hit a couple a shot or two. And if you get in transition, make a good play, and you're good. Really. So I think it's a great value pick for Minnesota at 27. A guy that I think fits the culture and can play pretty well and fit into that Minnesota scheme pretty well, personally. For Minnesota. Yeah, Terrence Shannon. Honestly, I thought Terrence Shannon was a guy that probably could fall out of the first round, to be honest with you. I definitely thought he was a guy that potentially could have fallen out of the first round, but he ends up going 27. We're almost at the end of the first round. We're almost there. We're almost an hour and a half in. We're going to get to the end. Um, 28, Ryan Dunn. This was originally the Denver Nuggets pick. The Nuggets flipped 28 for 22 to get Deron Holmes. The Suns dropped on 28, and they get Ryan Dunn from Virginia. 
if, if you don't know much about this draft, you don't know much about prospects, Ryan Dunn, defense. Defense, 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 defense is what you need to know. This guy is probably the best defender in the draft. Uh, he's 6'6", six, 7'1", six, wingspan, super athletic, gets a lot of steals, a lot of blocks. One-on-one, on one, he locks up. He's a, he, he locks up. Defensively, he locks up. Um, weird the question is, now what I said about the defense, flip it, and that's what his offense is like. We don't, what is his offensive role? You know, he's athletic, but he's not super skilled. He's not like he's going to go get a bucket. He can't shoot the ball very well right now. So it's like, what is his offense coming from? He's very Matisse Thibel, where he got drafted. Like, defensively, he's amazing, but how good is he going to be offensively? Can he ever develop? And Matisse Thibel, unfortunately, has never really developed much offensively, which is why he's kind of like a bench NBA player. And Ryan Dunn, I think maybe the same thing could happen with him, where defensively he's elite, but offensively, if he's not doing anything on the offensive end and it's hurting your team on the offensive end, how much can he really play and what is, how how much can he really impact the game, you know? Um, on a Suns team that defensively is needed as much. Um, so I give this pick, for me personally, I give this pick a B. Um, I thought they were going to have other options. I honestly thought Isaiah Collier probably would have went here to Phoenix at 28 when he was out there. But they ended up going Ryan Dunn, which I am not surprised at. Um, they need defense, perimeter defense, and he does that. But it's really about the offense, like, Again, how much is offense? How much can he do offensively to stay in the league and make an impact? You know, because you can. All, I feel like nowadays in the NBA, especially with all the spacing and stuff, there's only so much you can do on the defensive end if you're not a center. And but if you can't hit the three ball, and teams are doubling off you and stuff, like you're hurting the team. So I, I don't. I don't really know how that's gonna fit, but I do think you know with his defense and his athleticism, he's gonna be able to find a way. It's really the question is, what can he do for me offensively? Can he do anything for me offensively? And if he can, then that's amazing. Then he's going to be able to be in the NBA for a long time. If he can't, I don't really know. It's, it's going it's to be really tough. 29, the Utah Jazz take Isaiah Collier out of USC. Uh, he's a guy that coming into college and out of high school, he was one of the top. He had a number one pick case. Went to USC. USC had a bad year, and he fell all the way to 29. Personally, I had him, I think, 16 in my big board, and I had him falling in the draft. I think my mock drive, I had him going 26 to Washington in my mock. But he ends up going 29 to the Utah Jazz. Uh, there's still some good things to like about Isaiah Collier, though. I think he still has a lot of potential. Um, he's a point guard that's very NBA-ready already. The combination of strength and speed. He's already got a stocky body, but he's very fast as well. I think he's really, really nice. Really good ball handler. Um, he loves to get downhill, he loves to attack the rim and score, very aggressive in that nature. Or really, it's just about his scoring, his shooting, you know, how well can he become a shooter. Um, his defense, there's a lot of times where he kind of lacked on defense. There's a lot of times where he kind of just said, you know what, eh, whatever, on the defensive end. And there's a little bit of a turnover problem as well as USC. But I think he's a guy that has a high ceiling. Um, for And for Utah 29, I think it's a great pick. I'm giving it a B plus. Um, only because it's only B plus because they have a lot of guards. Again, I leave, I'm a big Keontae who kind of fits in a similar role to Isaiah Collier. Um, even though I think Collier is more of a point guard than Sexton is, they have Clarkson still. Like they have a lot of guards, which is the only reason why it's not an A for me. But I mean, if you're getting a guy like this that once was projected to be the number one overall pick at 29, like. Why not take a chance? I think Utah was in a great position with this pick at 29 to just take a guy that, you know, if someone fell, you know, or someone with high potential fell out of, like, the top lottery and stuff and you end up at 29, an amazing pick to just grab somebody. Him. In my mock draft, I had Johnny Furphy going to Utah because I thought I knew someone someone was going to fall. Someone, someone falls every year. And, you know, Isaiah Collier fell, and the Jazz were like, you know what, this guy is just a good, too good of a player to pass on. That we're gonna take them at, you know, twenty nine. Um, and the final pick of the first round, final pick of the first round, the Boston Celtics, Ironman, Creighton, a uh, guy that been around college basketball for a while. I remember watching him at South Dakota State. He was lining up, went to Creighton. Um,
guys that can shoot. Give it a B. Um, there's some good guys out there, but Bear Shyman, I thought fit. I thought Celtics maybe could go with a big man, but then after when I saw Deron Holmes off the board, you know Zach Eady was off the board. Um, they maybe could have taken a chance out of Dembona, but I don't know. So they just go with someone that's gonna come in and shoot the ball. You know he shoots. Um, he's a solid ball handler as well at six foot seven, and yeah, all he's gonna be asked to do is go on the three, go on the court, shoot threes. That's all you need to do. And if you do that. Then you got a chance. You got a you got a good, good good shot. And Bear Shyman can do that. That's a B pick for me. And that's the first round. Um, I think mostly a lot of pretty good picks. A lot of good, but this draft, of course, a lot of people calling. There's not many. There's not. There's no Anthony Edwards. There's no Wemby. There's no any like thing like that in the draft. But you know what this draft has? A lot of re guys that could become really solid basketball players and really solid have really good double-digit year careers in the NBA. And I think a lot of teams got better and got some really good role players that they can use that can be very impactful to winning. I personally, that, that's what I personally think. Um, second round, uh, I'm just going to talk about, uh, I'll talk about some of the guys that, uh, some of the things that stood out to me in the second round, at least. Um, let's see right here. Some guys that stuck out to me in the second round. Kyle Filipowski. Ends up dropping all the way to 32. He goes to the Utah Jazz. Uh, he's a guy that on my mock big board, I had him at 18. I mocked him around the 20s. He ended up going 32 to Utah. Um, it's tough because I, I kind of see it in a sense of he's kind of a 4 or 5 that doesn't really have one skill. Like he's a guy that is skilled. He can shoot, he can pass, he can dribble, all that stuff for a big man. But what is his one thing? Like what is like he's an elite shooter or he's a great rebounder? Like, what is that? And the questions of his position. Like, is he a four? Is he a five in the league? I don't know. But Utah, again, at 32, they have the chance where it's like, with this 32 overall pick, got a guy that was projected around mid-first round, let's take him. You know, what, what what's going to hurt us? You know, if he doesn't work out, whatever. Uh, Tyler Smith at 33 to the Bucks. I think it's a solid move. Um, I'm getting a guy that can space the floor. Tyler Smith is going to be a really good spacing four. He's facing forward. Uh, Tyler Colette goes 34 to the Knicks. I think that's an amazing pick for them. I thought that probably could have been a guy that they took with one of their first-round picks, but he ends up falling to the second round. I think he's going to be a good fit there. I think he fits the culture. Um, very experienced guy on a market that's going to come in, be able to play right away, potentially as a backup PG. Not going to make many mistakes. Going to be able to play make. Going to lock in defensively. I think that's a great pick for them over there. Um, Johnny Furphy ends up going 35 to the Pacers. Uh, Johnny Furphy was the guy that I had mocked around the mid-first round. I had him, I think, 20 on my big board. He falls to 35 to Indiana um, on a team that's already a playoff team, so he won't have to really do much in his rookie year. He's going to space the floor and shoot, and he maybe has a little bit more you know, potential hiding in there. Who knows? Uh, we'll see. Um, A.J. Mitchell goes 38 to OKC. I think that's very solid. Uh, Dembona goes 41 to Philly. Uh, Dembona is one of my favorite. When I was doing my big boards, Adam Adam Bono was one of my favorite second round picks, or guys that I had mocked and boarded in the second round. He ends up going forty one to Philly. Um, high energy center, six nine with a seven three wingspan, plays like he's seven feet. You know he's gonna play with a lot of energy, very athletic. He's gonna grab rebounds, he's gonna block shots, he's gonna catch lives, he's gonna do all that stuff. Can kind of give Joel some minutes off because Joel's gonna need that. Um, what other picks kind of stand out? Harrison Ingram going 48 to San Antonio. I really like that as well. Um, Harrison Ingram is another guy that I think can be very impactful to winning as a second round pick. One of those second round picks that has a really good, like, 11, 12 year career. I think Harrison Ingram could do that. And going to San Antonio, I think it's, it's great. Um, Tristan Newen, another UConn boy going 49 to Indiana. They also pick up Enrique Friedman. That's interesting. Um, Cam Spencer, another UConn boy. 53 to Detroit, the whole, dang, the whole UConn starting five got drafted, you know, which is why I'm saying Connecticut is up right now, um, and then let's talk about the one, Bronny goes to the Lakers, the Lakers end up taking Bronny at 55, whoa, so surprising, I think everybody in the world knew that if Bronny was there at 55, which he probably was going to be, he's going to be a Laker, and um, I'm wishing the best for Bronny. No hate at all to Bronny. I wish him the best. I wish I hope I honestly do think Bronny can be a really good player in the league. He has intangibles, high IQ, 
good passer, really good defender already. The jump shot looks good. I think that can work out. Like, I think Bronny can have a good career. You know, will he ever be a superstar all-star? Probably not. But can he be a player that sticks around for a while and is an impactful player to winning? Why not? Why can't he be? So he goes there. Um, and then Kevin McC Kevin McCullough ended up going 56 to the Phoenix Suns. Um, I think that pick is going to New York, I think. I or something. That do the New York Knicks, maybe. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on it. But I think that's going to the Knicks. Kevin McCullough. I'm every mock, go back to every video I've done in the NBA draft, every big board, every mock draft, every everything. I talk about the draft. I'm a huge Kevin McCullough guy. I think Kevin McCullough is going to be a guy that could be Bruce Brown esque. A guy that's going to be a really impactful player to winning, a do it all guy. He can shoot the three ball, he can defend, he can play with the ball, off the ball, he can do that. If he goes to the New York Knicks, clip it, mark it, clip this in like a couple of years if Kevin McCullough becomes something and becomes like a Bruce Brown type player. Kevin McCullough will be an impactful NBA player and have a good NBA career. He will be a really good role player. He'll be one of the better role players in the league. He's going to have a Bruce Brown-esque type career. Mark my words right now. That's what's going to happen. New teams that passed up on him for the first 55 picks are going to be looking back and be like, how do we let this guy fall to 56? Why didn't we take him? Mark my words. Mark my words. That will happen. And if it doesn't happen, then I'm wrong. Who cares? I'm wrong. You know how many people are wrong about the draft? You know how many people are wrong about in the NBA draft? I don't care. That's why I'm shooting because most of the time you're going to miss on your draft picks. The draft in general is just a, a shot in the dark. You never, we never really know how good these prospects are going to turn out until we watch their careers fold out. You know, we can say all we want right now about this guy's going to be able to translate, this guy won't be, this guy's going to be in a perfect fit. We don't know. We, we really don't know. So really it's just a shot in the dark. So why not take my shot in the dark and say that Kevin McCullough Jr. is going to have a great NBA career and you teams are going to be very mad that you passed on him at 56. That's all, that's all I'm going to say. And that's pretty much all I got to say. I think, yeah, um, the draft happened. You know, good draft. Now we go on to Summer League and Free Agency. Um, I'm, I probably, I'll probably make an announcement, but I might be going live during Free Agency, you know, to um, kind of, you know, for day one of Free Agency. We'll go live, live reactions to that stuff. I think that'll be very fun. Plan to go live potentially more in the future with this offseason coming up. Some doing some random talking NBA streams, maybe non NBA related streams, maybe on other channels too. Who knows? But uh, yeah, that's going to be pretty much it for today. Thank you guys so much for coming. We had a couple people come in here, come in and out, you know, which I love. Uh, my boy Jacob's in here, you know, my boy, my IRL boy. Um, he's a mod now, so if you say anything crazy, he will time you out. Um, but yeah, man, thank you guys for coming. Um, and Everyday Hoops, you know, this has been another edition of NBA, Ho NBA Everyday Hoops. Once again, if you like the content around here, consider subscribing, like, turn notifications, all stuff like that. I'd really appreciate it. It really helps out a whole lot. Join the membership if you want to. More streams coming soon. And uh, peace out.